have the pleasure to present you, George Didi Huberman. I don't know exactly how I will do that. I saw that in the program of François Quivigier, it was your book in the middle of the program, in an excellent position, uh, the surviving image, I don't know exactly how to say in English, uh, about Nachleben. It's an excellent book of George D. D. Burman, which is not yet translated in English, perhaps no. We are waiting for that because it is an important book about Abi Warburg, this uh, unnamed science uh, which include and extended beyond the limit of different sciences. And I think we are in the same dispositive. Ed Nersessian created the same uh, frame of thinking. We are with uh, history, philosophy, anthropology, ethnology, perhaps mythology, psychology, and also biology, looking for another science which is beyond the limit of, the sci of these different sciences. And I think it is the, the, the experience that we will do during these two days. Huh? And the purpose of our round table is to revisit the d important uh, concept of Warburg, like Nachleben, Pathosformel, Nemocene, and it is important to have now a discussion with, uh, with you, and uh, you have to use the podium. Thank you very much, uh, Francois. Um, I'm so happy to be hosted. How is the type of knowledge inaugurated by Warburg useful as today, useful for us today? Shouldn't we say simply that it is useful for opening the territory of that major science, this royal science, as to, uh, um, to use the vocabulary of Gilles Deleuze and Félix Gattari from their essay on the cartography of knowledge, Mille Plateau, that is history as such. Notice, opening can be understood in two senses at all, at least. To open is to enlarge, but it's also to wound. Now, this is not the same thing for the science of history, which is my interlocutor here. To accept its opening to images under the angle of enlargement as it is under the angle of perforation. To enlarge its domain to images means to accept certainly new objects, but it is also to capture them, to enclose them under a common administration that pre-exists them. This is to envisage interdisciplinarity from the perspective of territorial relations, so that opening itself to images reduces, more or less, reduces the extending of its empire, its authority over new landscapes and objects. Totally different is the opening that wounds, perforates, traverses the territory that hosts the operation. This opening alone possesses a critical dimension, dimension, I think, an extraterritorial capacity to, uh, to cross the frontiers, to create unsuspected paths and to modify the plane of consistency of the territory traversed. The work of Warburg has long been recognized for its capacity to enlarge the territory of the historian and also art history. But it seems more difficult today, even as yesterday, to recognize its capacity to wound, to critique this territory itself. It is not by chance that the importance of this critical aspect of Warburg's work has been recognized before everyone else by historians of art who were careful to construct their arguments philosophically, like Edgar Wint in the 30s, and by philosophers 
who are aware of, of cultural history as, for instance, Giorgio Agamben, because your quotation of the La Scienza Senza Nome is an expression taken by Giorgio Agamben from the uh, art historian Robert Klein. This meant that um, we are in this discipline like in a battlefield, a field of, of battle. It's a perpetual replunging into the game of clashing theories where certain objects are studied against others in order that certain models of historicity are meaning and meaning, excuse me, are made to emerge against others. It is thus that confronting the iconographic sign that Erwin Panofsky enlarged into an iconological symbol, Abbe Warburg will, in advance, construct the hypothesis of a regime of images based on a paradoxical economy, a visual, a temporal, a signifying economy of what I would call, and he in this house it's significant, the symptom that Freud at the same time was elaborating into uh, illuminating new shocking theory. It's impossible for me to go into the details here concerning the complexity of these epistemologic debates. Perhaps it will be enough to recall certain lines of divisions. There, where Panofsky was thinking of the symbol, by way of the logical development of a theme, as was shown, for instance, in his brilliant deduction of the iconography of Dürer's melancholy as deriving from ancient and medieval premises uh, synthesized for the occasion, Warburg was exposing figurative symptoms through the paradoxical eruption, not deduction, eruption of a memory of or of unconscious movements that entered into conflict with the common sense given to a sh of a shared culture. In short, when the symbol unites, the symptom divides. There, where the symbol brings into accord in a common cultural territory, the symptom mobilizes a disturbing transversal across that territory. There, where the symbol is handed down by a tradition, for instance, humanism, the symptom migrates and perforates the traditional evidence of common sense by an, an, what I call an anachronistic accident. For instance, the unexpected eruption of an Arab astrologer at the heart of a cycle of Renaissance frescoes. There, where the symbol speaks of a conformity of images and of discourses, the symptoms reveals as many of their differences, their failures to communicate, their conflicts, their incommensurabilities. There, where the world of symbols appear in the coherence of its unity, that of symptoms puts into play an unexpected diversity of montage, montages, heterogeneities. There, where the symbol includes us in the encompassing world of a great cultural infrastructure where everyone is recognized, the symptom brings to, to the surface as though pulling it up from below, perforating elements that, in their local space, booby trap such an identification. Therefore, the, sim the symbol semantizes the present from a prolonged past. The symptom de-semantizes the present for, from an instance of forgetting that explodes as a repetition, Nachtraglichkeit, return of the repressed, etc. One should understand that 
It's the entire psychic, temporal, and visual economy which finds itself here divided in this way between the encompassing territory of symbols and the traversing movements of the critical movements of symptoms. One example will perfectly, I suppose, illustrate this economy. We could even think of it as a kind of allegory. It is Abhi Warburg's Gradiva. The name of her is Ninfa. Ninfa, singled out by Warburg in Florence during the period between 1888 and 1893, when he was preparing his thesis on the mythological paintings of Botticelli. Warburg was attempting to make an archaeology of the first Italian Renaissance based on a new object that was first assigned to representation and then generalized to all forms of cultural life, symbolic life, therefore. This object, that object, was the living motion for which, before Botticelli, Donatello, for example, Mantegnato, but Donatello, especially Donatello, went in search of models from, paradoxically, the living motion, but the models were found in, uh, on the sides of Roman sarcophagi, death, where they found impassioned poses of lamentations, but also erotic pursuits, dramatic scenes of war, etc. What fascinated Warburg as he stood in front of Botticelli's paintings or similarly reading the poem of Poliziano, uh, the, the theoretical prescription of uh, Alberti, etc., was thus, I quote, the remarkable attempt to delineate transitory movement, basing his research on such a common evidence. Therefore, I repeat, symbolic form. Warburg wanted to focalize his gaze on a figure of particularity which in the art of Renaissance Florence repeated itself from place to place, never finding itself thematized as such, but breaking the surface and insisting like a symptomatic form, modifying in depth the economy of images whether they were employed as corporeal resemblances, perspectival constructions, likeness of fable, Alberti's Historia. Thus, the symptomatic form modifies the representation of motion, for example, for example of a character who walks or runs transversely to the supplement of two fundamental processes, two fundamental processes. Firstly, as a question of a displacement of intensity, which marks itself notably in an unexpected contrast between the sculptural impenetrability of Venus in Botticelli and the impassioned dance of the Bevectus Bayvek, the accessory in movement, unbound hair, draperies, the wind. The second process, fundamental, is inseparable from the first. Here, it's a matter of something that one could name an eccentric, transversal, symptomatic forces at play, and of their capacity to uh, sweep the representation like a breath of air be it a breeze or a high wind, to sweep the space where it supervenes, where it passes, where it occurs, in French, passé, and il se passe quelque chose. A lot of troubling things outside of the center of Renaissance paintings, as for instance, in the Primavera, Look at the right, the right border, 
Zephyr is fecundating the nymph Chloris, and the latter already vomiting her children in the form of a bracelet of flowers escaping from her mouth. One must define these weird scenes as transversal, since they modify from one border to the other. The totality of the image is affected by those motions, be it on the chromatic level, but you know, photographs of the verbo thesis, so the chromatic level is, uh, I'm sorry, it's not here, the level of the dynamism of, of forms or of their significance, of course, finally. It is equally necessary to qualify them as eccentric insofar as especially they emerge most often along the borders of the painting and metaphorically they denote what Warburg wanted to call the external cause of the image, external cause of which he sought to theorize the psychic tenor from the side of fantasia and dream images, images of memory, images of desire at the same time, images tied to passion, that is to say, to a regime situated below that of consciousness. Just as a wind is eccentric by definition to the place it sweeps, of course, the id to the ego that is upset, and the symptom to the symbolic world where we have taken our bearings and habits, so to the ninfa, that figure in movement who seems in Renaissance images to have emerged from a, the backstage and come to modify the total economy of the representation in making something impassioned, something of the memory of the desire which passes here. Warburg recognized innumerable instances Botticelli, Lippi, Pinturicchio, Mantegna, Leonardo, Perugino, Raffaello, etc., etc. But one day, looking at the border of one of Ghirlandaio's frescoes in the Santa Maria Novella in, of Florence, he discovered something like the quintessence of this phenomenon. And yet, it was only a serving girl, modest, humble, carrying a plate of fruit on her head. But it was a photograph of this gracious figure that came to be carefully framed and glued on the cover of a new notebook from 1900 entitled Ninfa Fiorentina. The manuscript presents us with a collection of fragments for what Warburg envisioned as his Ninfen project. At first, it takes the form of a friendly correspondence between the historian and the historian of art and the linguist Andre Yoles. On the question of Ghirlandaio's female figure that we see enter, so to speak, from the right hand border of the fresco, which is depicting the birth of Saint John the Baptist in the Tornaboni Chapel in Santa Maria Novella. There's no doubt that Yoles, in his text, has already integrated all the aesthetic and theoretical observations contained in the preceding analysis of Warburg on the representation of living motion. Thus, what Warburg had revealed under the iconographic angle of the erotic pursuit, uh, Zephyr, Chloris, Apollo, Daphne, Yoles, had maliciously displaced as a virtual play between the spectator himself and the ninfa, like the le poursuiveur, <laughs> which sows its grace in the works of Ghirlandaio. In the manuscript, uh, there is this uh, phrase by Yoles, Cherchez la femme, mein lieber. He wrote this in order to make clear that it's a matter of desire, like an inadmissible symptom at the, in the midst of the religious scene depicted in the Torna Buone Chapel. Yeah. 
he evokes the ethereal grace of her steps, making of her a quasi-pagan goddess, a practically, practically extraterrestrial, he says, creature, just as the air seems equally animated just for her. This is a cl closed space with a local wind that swells her antique dress, swells her antique dress. In short, this young nymph seems to be something like a phantom of feminine grace who traverses the scene with her light footsteps, an almost high aerial creature, an apparition that even provokes in Iolus a sentiment of irrepressible unheimlich, something between a nightmare and a tale for children, he says. So new questions present themselves, questions that Warburg was really asking himself, this question especially, where have, ha, have I already seen her? Which is very psychoanalytical, of course. This was a way for Warburg to dialogue not only with Yoles, but with himself, through the most radical prism of his conceptual scheme, namely that of Nachleben as the symptomatic model of the temporality of images. Not only did Ghirlandaio not respect the dogmatic iconography of the religious order that owned the church, but he even, in accordance with Tornabroni instructions, probably, um, sprinkling that figure of the ninfa all over the place, which soon provoked the anger of Savonarola, by the way. This is presentation of the Virgin in the same chap. Um, you see these two char the charming children who emerge from the two borders of the marriage of the Virgin. Here and there, female dancers tra tra traversing the nomination of John the Baptist. Of course, Salome. Uh, in the apparition of the angel to Zacharias, there is a representation in bas relief, and also this angel, a young, effeminate, winged man, clothed à l'antique. And in the ultra violent massacre of the innocents, there are some quasi menads transformed into furies, avatars of Medea. Finally, there is this young woman, wonderful young woman, carrying fruits as in the birth of John the Baptist, and she emerges in grisaille like a phantom from the background the background of the visitation. We are thus put confronted with a truly figurative strategy, a strategy of nomadic apparitions, eruptions, interruptions. Ninfa do appear here and there as this symptomatic figure coming from who knows where. Pagan antiquity, surely, but which one? Under what name? The nymph graciously opens the symbolic conventions of the space, which she traverses and modifies with a kind of perverse innocence, if I may say so. In reality, two territorial logics are attacked, critique, crit crit critiqued, that is to say, put into crisis by this nomadic figure. The first territory is that of church itself, in its role as a sacred place, and also in its role as a community of believers, values, 
taboos, of course. From this point of view, it's almost indecent in such a context to see the emergence of a figure as clearly sensual as this, on whose drapery accentuates the contours at the anterior level of the arms, the thighs, the breasts, with that gravity-defying body from the bare feet to the dancer's pace. Doesn't the Atlantica dress by itself impose already an image of a pagan goddess or nymph in this same scene consecrated to the chaste precursor of Christ? The second territory that is attacked and perturbed by the emergence of the ninfa is none other than the solemn bourgeois one of the family, of the Tornabuoni family, the church, the family. Giorgio Vasari has well described the birth of St. John the Baptist as a scene of a kind directly referring to the rites of maternity in Quattrocento, Florence. He says there is a beautiful woman who carries, following the Florentine custom, fruits and flasks of wine from the country. We can see then, with the, the pre, this precise example, how far the cycle of Ghirlandaio, in spite of his religious iconography, is inscribed with the lay symbols of the Florentine bourgeoisie, whom Christian clapiche Hubert has dedicated a wonderful anthropological study, and of whom Joseph Schmidt has analyzed the issues at, in, in a work on the Tornabroni chapel itself. In the symbolic economy, I say symbolic, of the birth of St. John the Baptist, the young girl who emerges from the right-hand side of the image is thus only a simple servant. According to a long-established custom in Florence, she carries from the country, from villa outside to palazzo in, in the city, fresh fruits and wine, which will give force to the mother lying in bed after the birth within the walls of her palazzo. But the symptomatic economy of the ninfa appears when we discover in that very conformity the critical effect resulting from differences that are incarnated by the young serving girl in her stride. We observe, for instance, how much she differs from the other serving girl, the one who in the background of the scene carries also the same flask to her mistress, and we catch ourself, ourselves imagining that the two figures are perhaps two versions, two fashions to see the same serving girl. Why not? Just an hypothesis. The effect of strangeness is found in any case doubled. On one side, the young servant girl with no name. In the economy of the portraits, uh, the young lady in the center, she has a name. Uh, prosopography, art history, history of portraits, okay, names. Uh, this serving with no name in the economy of the portraits, which are, besides, those of the great family. Sorry. Um, and she, uh, the, the, the young lady, has also two servants with, with her. On the other side, the young serving girls, girl comes from elsewhere from another symbolic space, from another time. The past epoch of paganism, uh, and another time than that of the bourgeois ceremony, the now of Florentine customs, or the evangelical event, the past of sacred history. They are all means, these are all means to denote the extraterritoriality ter the eccentric and perturbing, and in short, what I would call critical character of the ninfa, 
why does this figure traverse not only the figurative production of the Renaissance, but as well the entire body of Abbe Varbo's work? Because she crystallizes and up to a point allegorizes, just like Gradiva for Freud, a goodly portion of his theoretical choices, his objects of interpretation, and his models of historicity. We are hardly surprised that a panel of Mnemosyne Atlas has been dedicated to her. The nymph, surfacing in the fresco of Ghirlandaios, allegorizes first Nachleben, the survival, the afterlife, constructed by Abi Warburg as a model of temporality necessary to understand the economy of a recollection of images that was reducible neither to the idealistic principles of the imitation of the ancients nor to the positivistic recourse to an iconographic tradition. Ninfa, consequently, offers us the complexity of a trans-iconographic and trans-historical model in the context of a representation that refers to the, classic, the classics, the nymph is still only an adequate citation. Iconographic sign, perfectly consistent with the symbolic universe that stages it. Classics, Roman, Greek. But in a context of Christian representation, as is the case here, in the nerve center of the largest Dominican church in Florence, uh, with the, uh, it's the same in the case of St. Mary Magdalene being represented at the foot of the cross with the features of a minute, her hair unbound, stripped of clothing, violent, such as with unbound hair, violent and stripped of her clothing, which is how Donatello, or here, Bertoldo di Giovanni, present her, for instance. Therefore, the ninfa becomes a critical citation. It's a citation, but a critical one. She makes something surface as a counter motif, an unconscious of representation. In short, it's a symptom. It's a fleeting fossil traversing figurative space like an accident or an unbidden phantom. Moreover, the ninfa incarnates and allegorizes the economy of that pathos formel that Abbe Warburg tried to describe in the lateral transmissions and the missing links in the longue durée of Occidental art. It's not simply a matter of opposing static representation of medieval to the living motion in Renaissance, but it's also necessary to understand the phenomena of intensification of movement. This problem is crucial, in which Italian art, from Polaiolo to Michelangelo, experimented with all the possibilities. In the fresco of Ghirlandaio, the ninfa opposes her dy dynamism against the immobility of all the other figures. But she's not satisfied with merely walking graciously as everything converges in intensifying her motion, the position of her body, her left foot that is slightly lifted up, the robes streaming in the wind, and therefore enlarging her gesture and propagating it around her. We rediscover here a characteristic of Renaissance visual culture, the importance of which has been shown, of course, by Michael Batsandel and also Sharon Fermor, that is, the strictly choreographic fashion of envisioning the human gesture in representation. There is no doubt, besides, that the recognition of these processes of intensification responded in Warburg's work with a theoretical awareness of intensified forms in the total episteme of his own time. Aesthetic of intensity, Nietzsche. Passional attitudes, Charcot, Freud. 
Let's also recall that Warburg, in order to explicate the pathos formal in terms of superlatives of the language of gestures, utilized, utilized as an anthropological argument the analogy with the famous suppletion function, function supplétive, in the Indo-European languages studied by the linguist Hermann Ostov. Doesn't the intensification of bonus into melior and the intensification of melior into optimus, so three different radicals, suppose a change in the linguistic root? Therefore, the graceful, the graceful serving girl with the light footstep, who is unexpectedly invited into the iconography of John the Baptist, would thus be fundamentally deraciné, deracinated, a strange woman, a stranger, an extraterritorial. No green card. Anthropologically speaking, the serving girl's anonymity reminds us of one of Abbe Warburg's first intuition when reading the work of Edward B. Tyler concerning the survival observed in Mexico around 1860, he understood that the survivals only appeared contrary to the assumed traditions as transversal symptoms, phenomena that were unfit, to use Tyler's own expression, unfit. That is to say, inadapted, obsolete, and congruous ephemeral, anachronistic. Thus, in 1895 and 6, when Warburg visited the Indians of New Mexico, he would be interested in impersonal rituals, anonymous persons, stubborn symptoms, like that Pueblo woman on the right, that he photographed at the moment that she promptly regained the back hall of her quarters, fleeing the eye of the black chamber of the camera, or fleeing the reach of the occidental logos. The figures and the paradigm of the ninfa helps us finally to better understand where the history of images must find its efficacious end to appear and act as a knowledge that is, I repeat again, transversal to those disciplines constituted in the social sciences. Now the question is new for me, the, uh, the, 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 the neuro, neurology, the, the psychology. But in the social sciences, according to the limits of more or less defined territories. In photographing himself, a lady, peasant lady, in Settignano, here. Warburg made evident the temporal transversality of his, his concept of Nachleben, setting an image of a golf star between coins of antiquity and representations of Medea, he also made evident the social transversality of his notion of pathos formel, but chiefly he made evident the critical and finally in the last uh, plates of Nemozune, political dimension of this transversal, especially when he spoke about um, Geist's politic, for example, which remain inherent of all his analysis, which remain agonistic, generally pessimistic, confronted as they were to the point of madness with the devastations of the First World War, to, in general, the tragedy of Western culture, which is an expression he used, as well as Georg Zimmel, for example. Perhaps we should read the Warburgian transversals today in the light of Michel Foucault's writing in which eccentric knowledges fall under the term 
Heterotopias, or of Gilles Deleuze and Félix Guattari, I come back to Deleuze, because we learn in A Thousand Plateaux this, which is a major point, that nomadic knowledge, nomadic knowledges, however dismiss, dismissively uh, they are ranked, however light are the footsteps, can act in spite of everything like a real what Deleuze uh, uh, says is a machine of war against the territorial instrument of royal sciences, so to speak, always menacé, menaced by their self-sufficiency. Thank you. Thank you.